Sure. So let's get started. I'm sure more people will trickle in as uh, the talk gets started. But um, OK, so I'm happy to introduce Maureen Karpua. She's an associate professor in computer science at the University of Maryland, um, where she does research on multilingual natural language processing and machine translation. Um, some of her more recent work focuses on topics in controllable text generation more broadly, such as style transfer and evaluation and so on. Um, so, of course, topics that are very relevant to many of your research projects. Um, and uh, also, Maureen was on my thesis committee <laughs> when, when I was in grad school. Uh, Maureen's work has won several awards, including the NSF Career Award and the Best Paper Award at StarSem. Um, we're all very excited to have her speak today. So yeah, with that, Maureen, you can take it away. Thank you, Mohit. It's a pleasure to join you all remotely. Uh, I hope I'll get the opportunity to see many of you in person at conferences in a not too distant future. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my group's work on um, trying to make machine translation more human centered. So um, what I mean by that is that, you know, today we have great tools and techniques for learning representations, manipulating linguistic form by transducing and generating sequences. Right? Um, and, um, and this is really great. And this is not by no means a solved problem that we have really good tools uh, for sequence transduction within and across languages. But there's still a large gap between these tools and um, helping people communicate across language barriers. And so my group's work aims to build on, improve and adapt all these techniques to try to enable communication across language barriers more directly. Of course, uh, user uh, UI UX engineers are already looking at questions of how users interact with deployed systems. But here, what I'm interested in is thinking about what happens if we center humans throughout the research life cycle for machine translation, but more broadly NLP systems. How does it impact the research questions we ask, the problem we address, and then the kinds of techniques we might develop? So for instance, for machine translation, we might start by thinking about the task of translation, right? So we typically think of a machine translation task as some text comes in as input, and then we want to produce some equivalent text in the target language that's well-formed. Um, but that's a reductive version, definition of what machine translation is. If we put machine translation in context, we know that there's never just one correct answer. So we can make the task a bit more um, realistic perhaps, and also challenging by saying, well, well, let, let's not just try to produce one output, but can we tailor machine transition output to different audiences? Uh, and so this then connects machine translation to questions of style, um, which um, uh, where a lot of our recent work uh, on style transfer and evaluation uh, comes from. We might, uh, once we have a task, we go and collect some data, of course, uh, but when we work with our, the training data that powers all our systems, we can also ask where does that data come from? What is the human process that led to generating that data? And how does that impact the assumptions we make about it and our systems, right? So in the case of translation, how do human interventions in the translation process impact data and models? And um, when we think about centering humans, that might also lead us to designing different models. Um, so for instance, uh, how can sequence to sequence models incorporate user preferences in translations, in outputs in general, more flexibly uh, than with typical transformer models that are a little, that are opaque um, and kind of hard to interact with uh, for people. Uh, and then, of course, centering humans is going to change how we do evaluations. Um, you know, instead of evaluating just on held out data, which is, of course, a useful thing to do, um, it's also useful to think about um, how users, how people perceive machine translation quality and its errors. Uh, how does that impact their trust, their reliance on systems, uh, and um, what they're going to do in specific use cases. So uh, there's a lot to talk about there. So today I'll just present two samples uh, of this research agenda for so two steps in the life cycle, um, models and data. Uh, and I'm gonna start with models. 
So our goal here is to try to figure out how we can design models that let us um, be a bit more flexible in the way humans can provide some um, insights about the translation they might want to have. So for instance, here we have a source sentence in Romanian uh, with its correct English translation just below. And then we see that the mission translation system provides an output that is roughly okay, but um, has two words that are incorrectly translated. Uh, the empty system says struggled instead of plagued um, and translates ankle as bullying for some reason. Um, so uh, this obviously um, uh, is a problem. Uh, the correct meaning doesn't get across. Uh, but there are many scenarios where the people who do the translation have some external knowledge about the content they want to translate, right? They might have access to terminology databases, uh, or they might have some knowledge of the language so that they know that some words, they know how they want some of the words to be translated. And we'd like to incorporate that in the translation. Um, this was very easy to do with older machine translation architecture that kind of had explicit translation dictionary, uh, but that's a bit more tricky with neural models. So how is this done today? Typically, this is done by enforcing hard constraints that say, you know, if you've seen, if the user wants these specific words translated in a specific way, we can put hard constraints on the model to include them in the output. Uh, this could be done at decoding time through constrained beam search. Uh, or this could, be, this could be done um, at training time by training, incorporating knowledge of the constraints in training uh, to encourage the model to generate, translate the words um, at test time in a way that's consistent with what it's seen at training time. The main downside, so the upside of these approaches is that because um, these are hard constraints, the, it's guaranteed that the user choices are going to be used in the output. So uh, that's nice. But the downside is that by enforcing these hard constraints, it might hurt the fluency of the output. Um, for instance, we're seeing it here on the example where uh, the word plague is not properly inflected um, in, the, in the context of the output sequence um, to be plagued, to, to, be, to have a well-formed sentence. Um, and we're just not able to do that without using that word exactly as a hard constraint. Uh, and then these, all these approaches are pretty computationally expensive, more computationally expensive than the typical unconstrained uh, seek to seek generation process, right? So beam search, constrained beam search um, uh, um, incurs a big cost at inference time. And then uh, the constraint training method requires retraining models from scratch, incorporating the constraints. So every time you have new constraints, you need to go and retrain your model. So we were interested in figuring out um, if we can address these issues. So first of all, can we, to address the, the, fluence, the potential disfluencies that come from hard constraints, can we relax these constraints and let um, incorporate users' preferences as soft constraints rather than hard constraints? And then can we do that with minimal changes to training and decoding um, so that we can incorporate the constraint without additional costs compared to the regular seek to seek generation process? So um, our, our solution was to design a model we're calling editor. Um, that's short for an edit-based transformer with repositioning. So I'm gonna unpack all that um, in the next few slides. Uh, but the, the short, some of the most important things about this model is that it's a non-autoregressive transformer model uh, that's based on the popular Levenstein transformer. Um, our model introduces a dedicated upper, uh, editing operation that we're calling reposition um, that is very useful to reorder constraints and help integrate them into, um, into translations in a more fluent way. And then we also do some tweaks to, um, to the training setup uh, so that um, the models perform better by bridging the gap between training and inference. So let me tell you a little bit more about this model. So uh, how does this model work? Like all um, non auto regressive edit-based transformer, the way translation is done is not by generating the sequence from left to right as uh, autoregressive models do, uh, but instead by iteratively editing a complete output. So we're going to start with, we, we, have an, we always have a hypothesis for the complete translation of the source, and we apply some edit operations to make it better. The initial um, uh, sequence might be entirely empty, uh, as we see here. 
Uh, and then through various reordering and insertion operations, we might improve um, that sequence and repeat the operations until we decide we are done. Uh, previous um, edit-based models used two types of operations, insertions and um, deletions. Um, and so here we're introducing the reposition operation, uh, which lets us disentangle reordering from lexical choice in a way that we think is beneficial to modeling uh, and inference speed. So let me tell you a little bit about um, how that reposition operation works. So um, this reposition edit module takes as input um, uh, a token sequence um, and produces as output a reordered sequence. The reposition operation makes independent predictions at each position. Uh, so, you know, that's not ideal from the perspective of modeling language because we know that these are not independent um, predictions, but we make that simplification assumptions to enable parallelization at decoding time. Uh, and also because it lets us um, model the reposition operation as a, um, as a version of substitution, which lets us use a modified version of the Levenstein at a distance algorithm. That's an efficient oracle when we're training this model with imitation learning. So specifically what this uh, operation does is that given uh, a token sequence, the reposition module predicts the index of the input token to be repositioned to each output position. So let me show you that on an example. Uh, here, uh, we are uh, by predicting, um, by having a model prediction of six at input position two, we're saying that the sixth token in the input, U, should be placed in position two in the output. Uh, we use the same mechanisms for deletions. So here um, at input position five, we're predicting zero, which says that we want to delete that token. Uh, how do we make these uh, predictions? So at each source position, uh, the model predictions are based on the underlying transformer model parameters. We predict an index uh, um, that by taking the softmax of the dot product between the decoder state in the current position and the token embeddings in the input sequence, uh, essentially selecting an appropriate source token to reposition. Uh, and then uh, there's this uh, parameter B that's um, an additional vector that corresponds to deletion operations. So the uh, takeaway here is that we do not introduce um, uh, uh, more parameters. Uh, we work with the parameters of the typical transformer model, uh, but we use it to make these uh, additional reposition operation predictions. So once we introduce this operation, we can use the exact same um, uh, decoding framework, inference frameworks, to decode in three different modes. Um, regular and constrained decoding, where we're just doing sequence gener conditional sequence generation. Uh, in that case, we start out from an empty output sequence and then iteratively apply the reposition um, and insertion operations. We can do decoding with hard constraints. Um, and uh, the, the, what's really nice here with this not a regressive framework is that we don't have to do constrained beam search, which is really expensive. All we need to do is make sure that um, the, so we provide the words we want to see in the output as the initial sequence, and then let the model through its reposition and insertion operation insert the context around them. Uh, we make that hard constraints by making sure that the constraint words are never deleted. Um, and then uh, the soft constraint version um, is um, very simple. Uh, it, the only, it's just like in constrained decoding, except that we initialize, we start out with an initial sequence that consists of the constraints, and then we let the decoding run as usual without any modification. Um, so what we're seeing here is that we have a model that can be trained on regular sequence to sequence tasks without knowledge of constraints. Um, so regular training and regular decoding, the only thing that really changes um, by incorporating constraints is how we initializing uh, the initial sequence that we're going to um, iteratively refine uh, through the non-autoregressive edit based uh, process. So how does this work? 
Uh, we first evaluated it, this on a regular machine translation task, just as a sanity check to, to have a controlled comparison with prior work uh, on the same settings that these models, uh, these type of models have been uh, evaluated on before. So it's a range of medium to high resource uh, machine translation tasks. Um, and we see, um, so um, we have two metrics here, blow and ribes that measure translation quality. Um, higher is better. Uh, and we also measure decoding time. Um, and uh, we see that our model editor uh, decodes um, uh, a little bit faster uh, than uh, um, the Levenstein transformer on the medium resource Romanian English model uh, task while preserving translation quality um, and achieves a higher speed up uh, on the higher, more higher resource languages. Uh, just like the Levenstein transformer, uh, the translation quality is on par or slightly below that of autoregressive models trained on the same data. So overall, uh, editor decodes faster uh, and preserves uh, machine translation quality compared to um, state of the art. So that's just machine translation. Now let's turn to the task we actually care about, which is the one where we start incorporating lexical constraints um, during inference. Um, and so here we're comparing the impact of um, uh, different methods of incorporating constraints in various ways, soft or hard constraints in our model, in the Levenstein transformer, or in autoregressive models. So um, let's focus here on the impact of soft versus hard constraints in our model. Um, so uh, we are seeing that um, the soft constraints, the editor model, um, achieves uh, the best translation quality, a, a good balance of translation quality and constraint preservation rate, the CPR column. Uh, while speeding up decoding compared to hard constraints. Um, and uh, so we're seeing here the benefits of letting the model work, work with um, uh, giving the model the option of deleting the constraints if it can help generate a more fluent sentence, right? That's what we're seeing with the improved blur and ripe score. Uh, these scores are also um, um, overall better than the ones obtained uh, with uh, other non-autoregressive models, a Levenstein transformer, um, and the decoding times are substantially faster than the ones obtained uh, with the autoregressive models with constrained beam search. The downside with, the, with this experiment is that here uh, we were working with the existing WMT test beds. So these were you know, regular translation um, uh, test sets. Uh, and the constraints we select, we randomly selected the lexical constraints using words from the reference. So this is not a particularly realistic use case. So we try to evaluate in a more realistic scenario where we select constraints that come from uh, more realistic terminology databases. Uh, like Wiktionary and uh, these I8 um, uh, uh, dictionary. Uh, this is a, a setup that's been proposed by Dinu and others uh, in um, prior work on constraint decoding. And so we see here uh, that in this setting, uh, that's a bit more realistic uh, in terms of the nature of the constraint. Uh, editor with both with soft and hard constraint uh, performs better than prior work in terms of achieving good translation quality while uh, making good use of the constraints. Um, in this specific scenario, there's not a big difference between soft and hard constraints, uh, mostly because whenever, because the constraint terms are selected in such a way that they can be used as is pretty much all the time. So there's not um, as much of a benefit of the soft constraint uh, as opposed to hard. So overall, um, editor here achieves best combination of term usage, overall quality, um, and decoding speed. Um, and even compared to other non autoregressive models. And so we're attributing that to the fact that the, re the um, uh, reposition operation lets us disentangle lexical choice from reordering operation. And so that helps us make better use of the constraint terms in context um, and faster uh, with fewer edit operations, so faster decoding time. All right, so that's always a, a super quick uh, overview of this editor model. Um, my main point here is that these results show that non autoregressive model can be viewed as a framework to better control um, the output of sequence-to-sequence -sequence models in ways that can incorporate user preferences. 
um, and um, with minimal changes compared to a regular sequence to sequence task. Uh, we did, I just told you about machine translation, but we also been using these models to improve control uh, of output complexity in text simplification tasks. In particular, we've been looking at tasks where we're not just trying to produce simpler output given an input, but we're interested in different levels of simplification, different um, grade levels. Uh, and so we found that with editor uh, and introducing lexical constraints that represent the target levels of complexity, uh, we are able to improve control over the degree of complexity compared to uh, baseline approaches. So I see there are questions, so I'll take a moment to pause here um, and um, take any question on the first part. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I got a, a <clears throat> sorry, uh, I've got a, a couple of small questions. Um, one, does the model still need uh, knowledge distillation that's pretty frequently done with auto, uh, non auto aggressive approaches? Yes. And then um, additionally, uh, what are the steps taken during training to get it to learn the um, reordering and uh, insertion deletion operations? Um, because that's not necessarily given to you in the data set. Right. Um, yeah, so I, right, I, I didn't tell you anything about training. So, uh, so good questions. Um, so we're training in the exact same, so we, the, the general training framework is similar to that of other non auto regressive models. So we are using uh, distillation for all the machine translation experiments. Um, for the text simplification experiments, we found that we were able to do well without um, using distilled data. Uh, which uh, I think is quite interesting given that distillation is kind of necessary for MT. Um, and in terms of how the training works, so we, so, right, so we don't have, uh, all we have for training is um, examples of uh, sentence pairs, right? We don't know what is the gold sequence of uh, edit operations. Uh, so we are using uh, imitation learning uh, to, to train the models to predict um, the edit operation. So how do we do that? Uh, by generating uh, various initial um, um, uh, uh, intermediate sequence, uh, and then using our Levenstein and the distance oracle algorithm to figure out what are oracle sequences of edits to reach the reference. Uh, from, um, from these intermediate sequences. Um, and so the, the part I didn't talk about much for training is that uh, we try to incorporate more, to introduce more diversity in the, in the se intermediate sequences and therefore the sequence of edits that the model is exposed to uh, during training. And we found that this helps. Uh, so we do that by having uh, multiple ways of um, generating these intermediate sequences we start from, like the, what we call the rolling process, um, and uh, teaching, making sure that um, both the reposition module and the insertion modules are exposed to each other outputs uh, during training, since that's how they use that test time. Thank you. Uh, just one, one uh, small uh, additional question. Um, did you do anything special in that diversity to make it um, more likely that hard and soft constraints could be accounted for, like adding random words that or some other uh, approach. So we, yeah, so uh, so we did not change anything to the training process um, for to account for constraints. So in all the results I'm showing here. Uh, the models are trained just on the regular machine translation data without any without any knowledge of constraints, um, and uh, and then we just apply we just provide the constraints at test time. So the exact same model that's used um, in the you know standard MT evaluation um, is is the exact same model that's used in the constraint MT results. Um, so you know that's nice from a, a reusability of the model perspective, the fact that the models are able to make use of the constraints even though they're not trained on them. Uh, but there's also the flip side of that question is could we do better if the model was exposed to constraint during training? And uh, that's not something we've looked at yet. Thank you so much. Uh, 
All right, so um, if there are no other questions, let me uh, move forward to the, the second part of the talk, uh, where I want to tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing um, in our kind of deep dive into the data and trying to understand uh, where does the data we use to train our, uh, our systems come from and how does that impact um, uh, the training and the models that we get. So, you know, in MT, uh, we assume that our training samples are parallel uh, sentences, um, similar to the one we have here, where we have an English sentence and a French sentence that are equivalents. Uh, so, you know, of course, languages are different, so the same, the same uh, content is going to ex be expressed slightly differently, uh, but roughly here we have, um, we have pretty much exact, this exact same meaning um, and a pretty literal translation. Uh, and so that's what we think of when we think about, you know, our training loss and, and designing our sequence to sequence model. Of course, when we start looking at data, things are always a bit more messy than that. Uh, and so it's not uncommon in practice to have um, sentence pairs where uh, there is some content in common, uh, but maybe because of noise in the automatic alignment process, there are parts of the sentences that are not equivalent. Um, and so what do we do? Well, typically we, we you know, we treat this as noise um, and we make it part of the data cleaning process to, to remove these kinds of samples. What we found that was more interesting is that there are many samples uh, where things are somewhere in between these two extremes, like the, you know, super noisy that has to be thrown out and then the nice and clean equivalent examples. So here uh, we have an English sentence uh, that is arguably correctly aligned to its French version in Wikipedia, but there is content that is available in one language that is not in the other. Uh, so I've highlighted that in blue here. Uh, and there's also uh, some um, uh, word choices that introduce nuances in the information that is conveyed in one language versus the other. So the English here um, contains the phrase national anthem, the French side says patriotic song. You know, these are clearly related concepts, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and so why does this happen? Well, this happens because the, you know, even though the Wikipedia pages about this song in English and French are aligned, and it makes sense to align these two sentences because they have a lot of common in common, um, the, the two documents, that, the two pages are written for different audiences, um, so they might be written a little bit differently, emphasizing and including different types of information. Um, so what we were thinking is that, well, so this is not quite noise, right? So these samples, we might not want to throw them out. Maybe we need to tr treat them differently. Um, but before we figure out what to do with them, we needed to establish whether or not they matter, right? Are these just outliers? Uh, or are these uh, things that are actually quite frequent in our data and that we need to pay attention to? So um, we um, did an annotation study uh, where we asked annotators, um, we exposed them to about a thousand um, samples of English French pairs from this Wikimatrix corpus uh, and asked them whether they're equivalent or divergent. We carefully designed the uh, annotation protocol to encourage them to be sensitive to the subtle meaning differences like the ones I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so we did that by having them uh, categorize samples in, in a three-way classification scheme, not just two, to uh, differentiate between the some meaning difference uh, versus uh, completely unrelated samples. Um, and we also asked them to annotate um, with token rationales to motivate their decision. Uh, so we found that that helped uh, with the um, um, inter-annotator agreement. Uh, and on our, on our resulting and final annotation, to our surprise, we found that only 36% of the about 1,000 samples that we had were tagged as entirely equivalent in meaning between the French and the English. A quarter were like the noisy and related types, and 40% had some small amount of meaning difference. So, you know, clearly these um, small divergences are not just outliers, so we need to pay attention to them. So to figure out their impact on MT, the first thing we had to do was to figure out whether we could detect them automatically so that we're not tied to just this tiny sample of manually annotated data, but we can scale our investigation to uh, more realistic um, data. So we started by um, trying to automatically detect whether uh, bilingual pairs are equivalent or divergent. 
And we did that, like we do everything these days by fine tuning uh, multilingual BERT model. Uh, the key though, was to figure out, you know, where are the samples, where, where to get the training data to fine tune that model, given that we don't want to assume that we have manual annotations uh, for all languages and all um, uh, forms of data. So we want to do that with minimal supervisions. Um, and we want to train in such a way that our model is sensitive to fine grain divergences. Um, and so we took inspiration from what worked in the human annotation process, uh, knowing that some divergences are more fine grained than others is a pretty good signal. So we, we um, try to implement that in the way we generate the samples and in the way we design our training objective. So let me show you a little bit how that works. So given that we don't have any annotations for divergences, what we do is that we start with samples that we're pretty confident are equivalent and then we corrupt them to introduce divergences. So uh, we select samples from Wikimatrix Wiki where the English and the French side are very similar according to laser embeddings. Um, and then we introduce um, divergences in multiple ways. So first, uh, to mimic divergences due to content that is included in one language but missing from the other, uh, we um, randomly delete a subtree in the dependency parse of the English sentence. So here we're deleting how weak they are uh, from that sentence. And so that introduces that, that generates a, a divergent sample. Uh, starting from the same seed equivalent, we can introduce other types of divergences. Uh, another type we try is phrase replacement. Um, that's trying to model mismatches in content beyond deletions. So here we randomly choose a sequence of words in the English sentence um, and replace it by uh, another sequence of English words. So to, to try to make sure that these are not entirely ungrammatical, uh, we select a replacement sequence so that it has the same part of speech tags um, as the original sequence. So these are both pretty big modifications, right? In terms of how much they might impact um, the meaning um, of, the, um, of the sample. Um, so we also are uh, introducing some finer grade modifications. Um, uh, again, starting from the seed equivalent, we also perform some lexical substitutions where we select a random word in the original sentence. So maybe the word help here on the English side, and then we replace it by a hyponym or hyperneme in WordNet um, using a language model to help make the selection natural. And the reason we do that is that it mimics the um, um, operations that we know human translators use during the translation process, where it's common for human translators to make the content a bit more specific or a bit more general in their translation than it was in the original um, to make things easier to understand for their target audience. Uh, so that's the motivation for our lexical substitution operation here. All right, so through this process, we have a bunch of equivalent samples uh, and then divergent samples that we get through either lexical substitution, phrase replacement, and substitution. So that gives us you know, some positive and some negative samples. That also gives us some paired positive and negative samples, some what we're calling here contrastive samples. Uh, and so that's gonna be useful for training. But in addition to that, uh, we have a partial ranking on divergence granularity here, right? We can, assume that lexical substitution, because it impacts only one word and it's constrained semantically, uh, it introduces divergences in meaning that are smaller than uh, the divergences we see when we do phrase replacement or sub deletion So we have a partial ranking where, you know, seed equivalent are more equivalent than samples with lexical substitution and samples with lexical substitutions are more equivalent than those that um, either have a phrase replacement or a separate deletion. And so that's gonna be useful because we can gonna be able to use this information um, during training. So the way we do that uh, is that we define this objective where we, we don't just have like a binary classification task distinguishing divergent from equivalent samples, but we're gonna to learn to rank our contrastive samples. We're gonna look at pairs of samples, pairs of um, English. Um, so each sample is a pair. English French sentence, but we're going to have a pair of these sentence pairs uh, with a ranking that tells us which one is more divergent. Um, and we are going to uh, enforce a margin uh, between contrastive pairs of different types. Um, 
and otherwise, uh, it's a pretty, pretty standard fine tuning process on top of multilingual work. So how does this work? Uh, we evaluated on the data set we created. Um, and uh, so starting with a baseline, that's just a threshold on sentence embedding scores uh, on the left hand side, that's a gray bar, uh, all the way to our full model in dark orange, uh, which improves substantially over the baseline. Uh, we see that each type of synthetic divergence uh, used alone um, helps outperform the baseline. Uh, the F score is interest interestingly higher with the coarser divergence types, uh, which I think reflects the distribution of divergences we have in our, in our test set. Uh, but combining all synthetic divergence types by learning to rank um, helps do even better. Okay, so we now have a way of detecting um, divergences automatically, you know, not perfectly, but with some reasonable level um, of accuracy. And so we can turn to the perhaps more interesting question, which is like, how do these divergences impact machine translation uh, and what can we do about it? So how do divergences impact MT? Well, uh, we try to do that to understand that we, we uh, use the synthetic divergences we generated uh, for our detection model to do some controlled experiments uh, where we use a controlled amount of data um, and um, increase the percentage of divergent samples in that um, fixed amount of data. And then we measure the impact on translation quality. So we see that um, the divergences hurt the translation quality measured by Bleu and Meteor. Uh, but interestingly, the degradation in Bleu is only uh, you know, significant when half or more of the data uh, consists of divergences. Another thing that's um, interesting is that when we control for the types of synthetic divergences, the more subtle ones, the lexical substitutions that only impact like one token uh, per sample um, actually has a bigger impact, degrades blow more uh, than the ones that um, uh, led us to drop an entire subtree for the sentence. So the models are pretty robust to this to these bigger uh, divergences, uh, but they're hurt a lot by the more subtle lexical substitution. You might be wondering what you know. Okay, blue is nice, but what happens? Um, you know, if we look at things in, in a bit of a finer grain way. So one thing we looked at was that how frequent degenerated outputs were, how, how often we have outputs that include repeated sequence of n-grams, um, you know, that are clearly bad outputs we don't want to see in, in empty outputs. Um, and that we found that the, um, when training on uh, synthetic divergences, the percentage of degenerated outputs was substantially higher uh, than when training on equivalent data only. And uh, training on um, uh, divergent samples also hurts the model's confidence in its own predictions. Um, so that's what we're seeing uh, on the right-hand side uh, where we are plotting the average token probabilities uh, condition on the reference translation uh, for um, models trained on different types of data. So, uh, the, so the divergent samples do have an impact uh, on the translations, on the translation quality when they're very frequent, uh, but also more in you know, a more subtle ways on the confidence on the model uh, and on these like bad degenerated outputs. So what can we do about that? Um, we were trying to figure out how we can mitigate that impact. And so we proposed one approach, um, which is pretty simple, uh, which is to say, well, what if we know uh, whether each token has an equivalent on the other side, whether it's a divergent token. Uh, we can get that tagging um, automatically through a variant of the divergence tagger that I sent us level divergent tagger that I just talked about. So if we have these tags for each token, we can use them as factors in our model, right? So on the encoder side, um, for each position, we can have a tag that's encoded that gets an embedding uh, that's added to the embedding for the word um, uh, of the source sentence. And then on the target side, we can generate the sequence of equivalent of divergent tags in parallel um, as the actual output sequence and train our model uh, on that information. Um, at test time, uh, so what we want, so we have a, a source um, sentence and we want to produce a translation. We want that transition to be equivalent. So then we would tag the source tokens with the equivalent everywhere 
um, because what we want is an equivalent translation. We uh, haven't tried about generating unpurposed divergent translations. I'm not sure what the use case would be for that. Um, so we evaluated uh, along the dimensions of um, impact on MT that we had identified in our previous study. Um, and we found that with the factored models, uh, when training a model, so here we have different amounts of, we have a model trained on only on equivalent data. That's what we're seeing in orange, in yellow, sorry. And then we are adding data, increasing amounts of divergent data to that, to the data that was used to train the yellow model. Uh, and either we train the model without knowledge of divergences, that's what we're seeing in blue, or we train it with the factors, that's the um, divergence aware model in green. Uh, so what we're seeing here in terms of blur is that by being aware of divergences uh, with factors that helps us mitigate the degradation in blur from um, exposing the model to divergent data at training time. Uh, and uh, the blur score is close to the one without of the model train on equivalence only, even when um, introducing a substantial amount of divergences in our data. Uh, looking at the other dimensions of quality, like the um, degenerate outputs, we see that we have fewer degenerate outputs with the uh, divergence aware model. Uh, and uh, the model's confidence also improves a little bit compared to uh, the model that is agnostic to divergences. And the impact is the biggest um, when we have a large percentage of divergences. So to sum up, uh, I told you a lot of things about um, semantic divergences in bilingual text. Uh, but my main point here is that there are fine grained differences in meaning uh, in the samples we have in our training data. Uh, that, and they come from the, the way the data was generated. And so uh, we show that they're frequent and that they have an impact on models. It can hurt transition quality, you yield to more, lead to more repetitive loops in output and increase prediction uncertainty. Uh, and so you know, our position is that we should take these, um, these uh, properties of the data seriously rather than just treat them as noise or ignore them. Um, and so one way we can do that is to use them to inform machine translation training uh, through token factors to help mitigate uh, their negative impact. All right, so uh, this was, these were two samples of a research agenda on revisiting the machine translation research and development lifecycle to make it more human-centered. Um, I talked about um, how we define tasks um, by, um, sorry, how we define models um, that led us to um, new uh, autoregressive sequence-to-sequence -sequence model that help us control the output of sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models a little bit better. That also led us to um, take a close look at the assumptions we make about the data we use um, to understand its impact on, um, on training and on model performance and try to mitigate it. Um, I didn't tell you much about the other aspect of the life cycle, uh, but we also have a lot of work on context aware tasks, particularly on controlling the formality and complexity of machine translation systems. So we've been uh, designing systems that can, given one input, produce different types of outputs with different levels of formality and different levels of complexity. Uh, and that's led us also to do lots of work on style transfer um, and its evaluation. And perhaps most importantly, when we talk about human-centered MT, uh, that means centering humans and users um, in the evaluation. Um, and so we've looked at that from multiple perspectives. Uh, one is to look at the, the impact of different um, errors on users' perception of MT and how they and the trust in the system. Are there, mis are there some types of errors that lead users to be misled more than others? Uh, and so what can we do about them? Um, and relatedly, uh, we've been thinking about how we can evaluate machine translation uh, and design machine translation for more specific use cases rather than this kind of you know, generic task where we evaluate the machine translation data. Uh, and so I have a collaboration with um, HCI researchers who are focused on trying to help uh, people who work in multilingual teams uh, communicate better uh, and be more effective in their work. Um, and we have a couple of papers uh, where we're just starting to look at how we can design for machine translation for this specific scenario. Um, so these are just a few samples. There are lots of open questions towards really making um, machine translation sequence-to-sequence -sequence models 
and NLP as a whole more human centered. So I look forward uh, to your thoughts and questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, let's all unmute ourselves and thank Professor Karpo. Okay, so we have some time for questions. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, yeah, Mohit. Uh, yeah, I, I was interested in this divergences thing and particularly the effect it could have on the test set. Like I'm sure there are lots of these fine grained divergences in the test sets that could be impacting how people compare their model, especially if, you know, models are differ from each other in like point two blue or something, right? Um, maybe they handle these kinds of uh, divergent test inputs differently and maybe those aren't as valuable as uh, equivalent uh, test examples. Is that, does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, no, this definitely makes sense. Um, so in the experiments, I, um... I presented, uh, we were, so we were looking, so the, we were training on um, Wikimatrix data. So this is this data that's extracted from Wikipedia um, where, you know, we can reasonably assume that the divergences are more prevalent than in our test data, which is mostly TED Talks translation. Oh, I see. Um, however, that does not mean that there are no divergences in the test data, right? Um, so, in, one thing I'm interested in is um, looking at data generated by human translators, uh, because we know that translation you know, is, is never, even when human translators do their job properly, they might introduce some level of changes uh, in the output because they're, they're writing with because the languages are different. So, you know, inevitably you have to say things differently, um, but also because they they know something about their audience. And so, you know, in um, novels, it's not unusual to have translator notes where um, the translator feels like they need to explain a little bit more um, about something that was, might have been obvious to, um, you know, say the Chinese speakers, Chinese readers who read the original Chinese, but that's not clear at all to uh, an American English um, uh, reader uh, uh, sitting here in the US. Um, and so, so we have not accounted for that uh, in the experiments that, um, uh, that I presented today, uh, but that's one thing I'm interested in, like trying to see, can we push this further uh, and you know, take like the, this same kind of analysis that we've done on this more, still more obvious meaning differences that we can find in Wikipedia data, and see whether uh, they can be used to uh, shed some lights on the divergences that arise in the human translation process. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Catherine. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. I was just wondering, because you gave a lot of examples that were French-English pairs, um, if you and your students have worked with other um, source languages and if you've noticed a difference in working with source languages that you and your students know other than English um, versus don't know. Yeah, so we started on English French for a very selfish reason. It's just the only two languages that I can, you know, that I'm fluent in. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why we started with that. Uh, in our in the papers, the um, uh, EMNLP and ACL papers with um, Eleftheria Briaku, we're also looking at Greek, uh, and that's because Eleftheria is a Greek speaker. So again, uh, we, we can do some analysis um, um, uh, at, a, at a level you know beyond like looking at the scores. We can we can look at the outputs, um, but I think there's more to be done in terms of um, looking at the diversity of languages and understanding. Um, how do the differences in typology um, relate or do not relate to the meaning differences? Right? Because um, we know that different languages express things differently. So there, that leads to differences in sentence structure. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to see whether um, for the languages where there's a syntactic reason when you need to say things differently, does that also lead to more differences in meaning or not, or uh, how those things correlate? Thank you so much.
Okay, if there are no more questions, maybe we can uh, wrap up the talk. So uh, thank you so much, Professor Karpal. Let's all unmute ourselves and thank the speaker once more. Thank you all. I yeah. look forward to talking with uh, everyone in, uh, in individual meetings later. Yeah, they will start at 1.30 and I think there are four of them with a half an hour break after the first two. And they'll be in the other Zoom link. So um, yeah, so we'll meet you there. Okay, I'll just stop the recording.